Please join me in the call to worship. This is the day of the Lord. This is the day of the Lord. This is the day of the Lord. Amen. The hymn is number 302, Come Away from Rush and Hurry. Hymn number 302. Please join me now in the invocation as we pray together. O God, in our effort to hallow this day for your sake, teach us what will honor you. Help us, O God, to rest and be renewed in our strength from you. Remind us, O God, that we were created to serve and love one another through your image placed in each of us. Bless us, O God, with restored energy and renewed focus for the days ahead that you grant to us. These things we pray in the name of our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, God gives us this day each week as a time to rest, renew, replenish, and bless those around us. Thanks be to God.
read responsibly from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 8. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the holy name of the Lord our God. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Remember the benefits of our God. Who forgives all your Who satisfies you with good as long as you live. Who renews your youth like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. The Lord made known God's ways to Moses. God's acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Thank you, Andy. Elvis has nothing on you. <laughs> our hymn is number 371, Now Thank We All Our God, hymn number 371.
Today's Gospel reading is from Luke 13, 10 through 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on this Sabbath day? And when he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. I remember the arrest as if it were yesterday. No, not my own arrest. But it was one of those life-shaping events for me that I think I've shared with you before, but it is so burned into my mind that it often comes back to me. It was the arrest of the local manager of our Walmart because he had the audacity against the blue laws of the day to open his store for business. I can also remember the plaque as if it were but yesterday. I was standing in a typical small New England town in the village green looking at before me a tableau worthy of holding the Ten Commandments that had inscribed upon it some eight or ten things that basically communicated to people what was prohibited in the village green on Sunday. And the message was almost everything. It seems in our effort to hallow the Sabbath, we humans have often created repression and regulation and rules that make it sometimes more difficult than the help that God intended it to be. And it seems that that was the case in Jesus' day as well. For as you heard in our New Testament reading, the religious types of the day are indignant with Jesus because he has not kept the law that they had established to hallow the Sabbath. Why is it that we struggle so much with this day? What is it about us that makes us want to build a fence around it in such a way that it makes the day more difficult than helpful? I don't know the answers to all of those questions, but I do think that this passage stands before us today as a reminder of several things about the Sabbath. And first and foremost, it's important to see in the passage that Jesus believed in the Sabbath. He believed in gathering in community 
and reflecting on the things of God and renewing the energy that life would require of him in days ahead. Jesus just didn't keep the Sabbath in the same way that others around him kept it. He seemed to want to broaden the borders of the Sabbath and to suggest to people that it didn't have to be a difficult and confining day in order for it to be a day of rest and in order for it to be a day in which God was honored and hallowed. After all, God gave us the Sabbath as a model after creation to suggest that as God did, we would all need a time to rest. And God commanded our Hebrew forefathers to keep the Sabbath as a reminder of their inability to do so when they had been slaves in Egypt and forced to work as much as they possibly could until they basically dropped. Jesus believed in keeping the Sabbath. Jesus offers the Sabbath to us to keep just in a different way than maybe we've thought about keeping the Sabbath. I think the passage also points out to us very vividly that Jesus believed that the needs of people were always more important than the principles and regulations that govern behavior or govern an organization. People in Jesus' world were at least as important, if not more important, than animals. That's why he said to those religious leaders, you take better care of your animals on this day than you're willing to take of this poor woman who has been bent over with illness for 18 years. If you're going to do things to help your animal survive, it would seem to Jesus you would at least do the same, if not more, for people in need. Jesus always believed that we had to have structure in life for all of us to be able to live and get along. But Jesus never felt that structure should get in the way of helping people in need. Because most of all, he believed that people who had needs were the most important things in his world and in our world. Jesus, it seems, also believed in liberating people and things from things that unnecessarily bound them so that in their freedom they could experience the fullness of life that God had created them to experience. It's sort of a visual if you think about this woman, and I can't do it very well behind this pulpit, but she had spent 18 years sort of looking at the world like this. Now, can you imagine looking at the world like this for 18 years? You don't see the world as most people actually experience it. You can't engage the world as most people actually engage it. And Jesus felt like she deserved to be liberated from what had bound her from being able to experience the fullness of life for so long. And I really think that it's in that point that most of us can also find the good news for ourselves in this day. For while we may not be physically bent in such a way that we've been looking at the world like this for 18 years, many of us are bent down by one thing or the other. The responsibilities that are required of us. The career that doesn't seem to be going exactly where we thought it would go or the retirement plan that doesn't seem to be working out just like we thought it would work out, the never-ending, always-crammed, 
ever minute filled schedule that many of us feel necessary feel it necessary to keep in order to keep up in our world or all of those treasures that we've spent a lifetime accumulating because they were so important and now we spend most of our time managing them wondering why we ever acquired them in the first place. No, we may not be physically bent over in our world like this woman was, but many of us are bent over in one way or the other that I've just described. And Jesus wants to liberate us from that load so that we can stand upright again and see the world as it should be seen and experience the fullness of life for which God created us. And I think there's another point to this little part of the story. We may not ourselves feel bent over by the world, but many of us may be the force that's causing others to be bent over. The requirements that we want to place on people and life and institutions and things, the power that we're willing to use to tell someone you must, you should, you have to, how often do we ourselves become the force that bend people over to such a way that they cannot see the world as it should be and they cannot experience the fullness of life for which God created them. Jesus believed in liberating people who were bent over. And we also ought to be about that kind of liberation. So I think the passage leaves us with at least three questions, or four, that we should consider as we go forward from our time together today. I think it asks of us, as it asks of those religious leaders, what is your relationship to the Sabbath? Is it a day in which you can find a time to renew and replenish and be able to engage the world again on the other side of it? Be a blessing to the world rather than one who is always seeking to take from the world? Or is the Sabbath just another day on your ever busy calendar? What is your relationship to the Sabbath? Can it be said of you as it was said of Jesus that you believe in the Sabbath? And if you believe in it for yourself, do you also believe in it for others? I think the passage also asks of us, what is your belief about people who are bent over in need? Do you believe that where we have opportunity, we ought to seek to alleviate those loads? Or do you, like those religious leaders, just want to look and say, Oh, that poor thing. Somebody ought to do something about that. What is your belief about people in need? And I think the passage also asks of us, what things are binding you and me from full freedom, from being able to live life as God created us to live life, from being able to see the world as God intended us to see the world. What is it that is binding you and binding me? And what are we willing to do to get rid of those binding forces so that we can be liberated? And I think the passage also asks of us, what things do we use to bind others? 
believing that it is our right and responsibility to do so. And are we willing to let go of that power so that everyone can experience the fullness of life and see the world as God intended them to? May God give us the grace to believe in the importance of the Sabbath and its observation. And may God give us the courage to be willing to loose those things from ourselves and others that bind people in such a way that they cannot experience the fullness of life as God created them to do so. Amen. We're going to receive an offering at this time. May God bless the gifts that you have brought to give. And we're also going to receive the blessing of Andy singing for us one more time.
gracious God, loving Father, creator and sustainer of us all, receive our gifts now and bless them to the work of goodness. Give us hearts with which to give that are always open and willing to remember that our gifts reflect our thanksgiving for the ways in which we have been blessed by you. We pray today for our world, O God, for the difficult environmental situation that's happening in the Amazon. We pray that somehow they will find a way to stop the fires. And we pray that you would give us a renewed vision of the stewardship to which you called us in the very beginning to be your partner in blessing and multiplying the world for the good use of all who are a part of it. We remember today, O oh God, those who serve us in the world, and we pray for your blessing upon them. Those men and women of our military who give sacrificially of themselves, those policemen and firemen and first responders who deal with us when we are sometimes at our very worst, but in our most important hour of need. And for all of those who simply do jobs that we take for granted, that make our everyday lives possible, May your goodness and grace, your mercy and love be apparent to all of these groups who work to make our world a better place. Help us, O oh God, today to have your vision for our world, to be able to live with open hands and open hearts and give of ourselves in ways that will bless the world. We pray today, O oh God, for Ed Smith as he goes for a consultation on Wednesday and ask for your blessing upon him and that you grant the doctors wisdom to know what to do. We pray for Marlene as she deals with health concerns and ask your blessing upon her. We pray today, O oh Lord, for Terry as she recovers from illness and loss. We pray today, O oh God, for Bill Rimels as he is hospitalized, recovering from a procedure. We ask for your blessing upon him and upon Joanne. We pray today, O oh God, for those children who are separated from their families at our border. We pray that you would reunite those families, that you would help them to get the care they need to have the best health possible, that you would help them to find a place of welcome for their future. We ask your blessing upon them. And as we prepare to go from this place today, God, we pray that you would remind us of the model of Jesus as our path to walk in the days that we are granted. These things we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.